Alright, and we're back. Boom. Things. Stuff and things. Ghosts and stuff and things. More ghosts and stuff and things. Wow. Um, so yeah. What is the tentative name for this project? What are we going to call it? Bueller, Bueller, anyone, a a anyone? <laughs> yeah, I totally opened a uh, word title generators. <sighs> Ooh, RPG names. That's what we need. Bum, bum, bum. Hmm. I'm tempted to go something super, super silly and traditional and do something like Siren's Call. Or, um, I can, I can, I can put this in a file. Titles! Let's make this all real big. Even bigger. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, whoops. Yeah, but what makes an interesting title, Johnny? What makes the title stand out to you? Hmm? Challenge. Too big. There we go. I don't know. The magic feather. Feather, feather. Um, a cool adjective, eh? So you subscribe to the Marvel School of, of Titles. The Amazing Spider-Man. The Incredible Hulk. The Astonishing X-Men. The Uncanny X-Men. Me, personally, I like titles that, um... I like titles that mean something and by that I I mean, I mean uh, by that I'm talking about titles that indicate something about what the story about something that happens in the story or something about its theme or something uh, actually, uh, in terms of 
chapter title naming, which is a little different, but I actually like uh, stuff that's named after dialogue, uh, things people say. Um, I'm cool with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> right and it sounds boring because or let's say this from the bottom years the billionaire's decision and the reason it sounds boring is because it has nothing to do with the, the dramatic art it, it, the billionaire's decision doesn't matter To the, to the story, to what we're trying to do, to the theme. I mean, equally boring, or maybe a little less boring, it would be more likely to be the killer for hire's decision, the mercenary's decision. Uh, again, boring, but not as boring, because it's relevant. Bag of Blood. I actually don't mind that, though it's more of a, a vampire title. The Siren's Last Task. Blood for the Blood God. Stop quoting Horace Heresy at me. <laughs> God damn it, Sam. <laughs> yeah, but the Demon Awakening is, is kind of lame. I'll write it down. I'll write it down. Actually, I'll write all of them down. I'll, I'll copy and paste them, guys. Oh. What the? Copying all the things out of the chat. It's not a bag, it's a wine skin. I'm not trying to block the creativity, I'm trying to focus it. Trying to focus your creativity. Because I'm of the opinion that the title should have nothing to do with the demon and should have everything to do with the siren and possibly have something to do with the siren and the mercenaries relationship. And fair enough, I mean, this is only going to be a working title. It's okay that we don't know enough about the story right now. I just want something to call it other than the short story. Um, that being said, I'm actually using this a little bit as an exercise to help focus what we're doing. Names are very important. Uh, they have been for, for years upon years. And to the point where when we talk a lot about uh, oral storytelling and, and ancient legends and stuff, there's a lot of like 
knowing your true name and the power of names in magic. And and interesting enough, that's a I'm gonna write it down here just because nothing else. But knowing your true name is is an important part of demonology and and kind of the way that we've talked about demons for for in stories for many years. Um, So there, th like that's that's a concept that relates to to what we're talking about. Um, I actually kind of like Fear of the Siren, but yeah, maybe maybe I'm tempted to do something like old school B movie style and and go and do something like kill the call of the siren. Because there's an aspect that I realized I've been thinking about subconsciously but hadn't quite grasped yet, but I just got it. And the reason I immediately went to it, to the Siren's Call, is because that's an important part of the way that their mythological stories are. The siren is supposed to be a temptress. Temptress. She's supposed to be a seductress. She's supposed to seduce you to her way of thinking. So. That's an important aspect to what we're trying to do. It's an important aspect because, always with the because, um, the killer for hire, in a lot of senses, in, in, in a lot, in some sense, is being seduced. He's being pulled away from his original goal. The siren's call is is affecting him, right? So that has implications on on both how the story is going to play out and and whether or not he really makes his own decisions. Or, or is it a, a magical influence? And, and I'll tell you straight up that that scene, that scene with the physical confrontation between them, that the scene that I was playing on starting with, is going to play this right away. It's gonna be the first thing we encounter is is this weird seduction of the siren. And maybe the call of the siren needs to have a bigger a bigger part to play in the demon ritual. Things to think about. Things to think about. But yeah. I'm okay with with it 
implying a horror story aspect, I think we're dealing with monstrous creatures. So that implication is okay. We like I mean, we haven't said anything about who the killer for hire is. Is the killer for hire even human? There's nothing that says he has to be. Is the billionaire human? Likely. I think so. But he doesn't have to be. So having a horror style, stylized, like a horror stylization, I'm okay with that. I like the implications of that. Because we're, we're playing in, in a lot of ways with one of my favorite, like, sort of exploratory themes is what it means to be a monster. That's a good theme. I like that theme. So there you go. From exploring a title, we've come, we've, or me personally, I've, we've discovered a little bit about how a specific opening scene is going to look. Uh, a big theme that we're going to use. Uh, ask questions about who our characters are and why they're doing what they're doing. So, there you go. And I think the winner that I'm going to pick is actually a slight difference. I think I'm going to pick Fear the Siren. Because it has such lovely implications about who the villain is. So, there you go. It's currently 9.23. And I am totally talking to you. You specifically. You who asked me questions. <laughs> but the walls have ears, you know? That's cool. I like that. I like that. It's not bad. I'm going to add that to the list. Oh. But yeah. Just adding some metadata. Done. Cool. So there you go. And by by no means is this the final title. This can change. Uh, but I like it. I like it at the moment. I think it. I think it gives us a a, a direction to aim it. It gives us a, a feeling of tone. It gives us a feeling of theme. Uh, some of the plot elements and conflicts. I like it. I like it. Bam. All right. So, last thing we're going to talk about today. Uh, book club. Bum, ba, da, ba.
funeral. This is this week's book, writing fantasy and science fiction. Uh, it includes the old. Uh, yeah, I I realized that after John, I, I got there. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, where is it? Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So this is the book, writing fantasy and science fiction. Uh, it originally started out as this book, How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy by Orson Scott Card. Um, so this entire book is in here. Then they added uh, some essays by Philip Athens and Jay Lake, and uh, some other stuff by the crew at Writer's Digest, uh, who are the publishers of, of both of these. Um, so yeah. Uh, I've actually read a significant portion of this, and that's in here, so that's awesome. Uh, the other thing is, is I have Orson's Got book, Orson's Got Cards book on characters, uh, which he also has elements of in here. Um, so I'm actually fairly familiar with a bunch of the content of this already, uh, which is awesome. Uh, it means I'm on the right track and I know things. Also, because I've been super lazy about actually reading physical books lately. Um, so I need to improve that. I should maybe see if I can get some ebooks uh, somewhere. Maybe the library. Anyway, I'll work on it. I'll, I'll be better. I'll be better. I will, I will read better. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by this book. Uh, there's a couple lessons in it that have stuck with me for a long time because I actually got this book when I was uh, 15, I think? 14? Somewhere around there. I was in high school. Like, or, no, I was in middle school. Yeah, so 13 or 14 or 15. Somewhere around there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, my favorite lesson, uh, and is something that's really difficult, or not really difficult, but it's something that, that not everyone thinks of, and it gets weird, but when you're writing characters in a, in a fictional setting, don't go out of your way to explain to the readers what things are. Present context for the reader. What I mean by that is that it's more effective for your character to... to reveal what something is by their own actions than it is to tell the reader what something is. Your characters don't think about things the way that the reader thinks about things. If there are flying cars in the universe that the character is in, they're not going to think about how weird a flying car is every single time they see one because they see one all the time. We don't, when we go for a drive, we don't sit down and explain to our passenger what a combustion engine is, how gas works. We might explain rules of the road to someone from a foreign country or something similar. Sure, totally legit. But we don't explain how a car works because pe everyone knows how a car works. The only way you, the only reason you would explain it to somebody is if they didn't know how it works, like a kid, or uh, someone who's never seen a car before. I, I know that sounds crazy, but you know there are some some populated areas in the world that don't have modern technology. Not a ton of them, but there are some, for sure. Um, and in, in, in having your character explain things that would be normal for them actually diverts the reader's attention away. It, it, it stops them from being pulled into the story by pointing out how, how weird things are. Um, it distances the reader from the story and they're like, it ruins their immersion. So that's one important lesson to learn from this book. Uh, the other, uh, another important lesson are types of stories. Um, I originally was going to talk about this a little bit more as part of the lesson, 
Uh, but I didn't feel like it really fit in anywhere, so I didn't. Uh, but there are four main types of stories. Uh, there's the mid-year story, the idea story, the character story, and the event story. Um, so a mid-year story is a setting story. The point of the story is to show off the setting. How it's different from our world. Commonly used for things like historical fiction. Or, sorry, not historical fiction. Altered history fiction. Uh, what changed? What made the world different? How would it be different if certain things changed? In a lot of ways, Lord of the Rings is a mid-year story. We start in one place, a very small place, and, and we, we see parts of the world as it builds and, and how that interacts. There are other elements, of course, to Lord of the Rings and stuff uh, that do make it a little bit more of a character story. But in a lot of ways, it is, it is a, a mid-year story. Um, so an idea story. A story showcasing some sort of idea. Uh, some sort of point, lesson, uh, things like that. Uh, character story. Character stories are the most common type of story told nowadays. Uh, mostly because the film industry is super into character stories. Uh, character driven stories are like the thing that people want. Because it's easy for us to identify with characters. And characters and their wants and needs and identifying with them will drive story home. Will make it impactful. Will sell tickets when people talk about it. You don't really get the same impact with a setting story. Though you can. Um, but it's different. And, and it's one of those things where these types are not mutually exclusive. By focusing on one... That doesn't mean you're cutting out the rest. It just means that one's going to be the focus and it's going to take most of your attention and, and present itself more often. Because um, you should never ignore characters. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't. So yeah. So that's a character story. Character driven, about characters. Character arcs. All that good stuff. Stuff that we talked about today. I mean, three arc, three act structure is is the the basic of basics of, of how a character story is constructed. Um, and then the event story, things happen, you react to them. Event stories are not very common anymore. Uh, they used to be fairly common in like the Middle Ages, and things like that. Uh, like if you read any like old King Arthur stuff. Uh, or uh, any of the, uh, what was that period called? Um, the sort of uh, romantic era of chivalry, or the age of chivalry, actually stories from the age of chivalry. Uh, they tend to be very event stories um, where things happen and characters react. Event stories are considered fairly weak in today's narrative standards because they um, the character never takes a proactive role in an event story and if they never take a, a proactive role it means things are just always happening to them and it, it doesn't really satisfy any of our any of the readers uh, needs like it doesn't it doesn't communicate ugh I'm not communicating. Uh, it doesn't... We, we don't identify with characters who only react to things. We identify to characters who have strong wants, strong needs. And having someone who just reacts to something is not impactful. It doesn't create good drama. Um, that's not to say they can't react to things some of the time, but I'm just saying like, if that's all they're doing, it can get boring quick. Yeah, and it, it is certainly, it's more documentary than narrative, for sure. And like I said, like, it's more old-fashioned. It's not something that's very common. But if you're doing a stylistic thing, uh, it, it, it can certainly help. I mean, I think of stuff like that. Um, 
I, I think a lot in terms of uh, when I'm approaching fantasy, what are the myths and legends or the stories that people tell? Because we, we tell stories about King Arthur, we tell stories about, um, you know, like the Salem witch trials, and like there are, there are cultural stories that, that we talk about a lot. And whether or not they're historically true or not, whatever. But, you know, like Greek myths, um, uh, Norwegian myths, uh, those are, you know, big ones, right? Um, so in your fantasy society, like, they're going to have stories that were passed down that, that people still remember thousands of years later. I mean, they're probably not the same stories. They're probably different from being passed down and stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are, there are bases, right? So things like event stories and all that are great for, for inserting legends into other narratives, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, cool, good stuff. Lots of learning in this book. Um, I'm excited. Well, the second part is on, um, sort of. Uh, 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 a reasonably modern take on where the sci-fi and fantasy industry is at and how it got there, uh, which is super fascinating to me. Uh, and I do want to read a little bit more history books about genres and stuff. Uh, I do have a couple, and I hope that we'll cover them at some point uh, in the book club. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think that's it. If you have any questions for me, let me know. Uh, otherwise, you can contact me on my Twitter at Freak Lab Mishaps, or uh, there are links. That yeah, there we go. There are links to contact me on the web address below. Right there. Um, and also VODs, check out the VODs, uh, I should be posting the one for this episode tomorrow, uh, as well as show notes, uh, and, uh, other documentation, uh, that I realize I never really explain to people on stream, uh, but yeah, on the website there are show notes, so all of the notes that I've used to prepare the show and talk about on the show. Uh, I update those after the show ends so that they're complete and they have errata and, and I fact check myself and whatever else because I realize I make a lot of mistakes. As well as uh, all of the stuff we've worked on will all be posted in a PDF on there as well. So if you want to check out uh, the, syn the synopsis and log lines and all that uh, or any of the other stuff we've done on the show, uh, those are all available. So yeah. I uh, think that's it for me tonight. Unless anyone's got any questions. Nope. Chat looks dead. Rah. Bang, bang. You feel lucky, punk? That's not even the real line. This is the one everyone says. Feel bad now. Bastardizing. Anyway. Uh, I'm sweating to death. So, yeah. You can call it a night. Turn off these lights. Go cool off. <laughs> uh, thanks for hanging with me. This was Accidental Origin. My name is Brendan. And this is the end of the weekly writing web show. So, yeah. Bye, all.